the number one fan of a two-time NBA MVP. Have you always been a basketball fan? No. Mm. Oh, gosh. Not at all. Meet the Curry whose star is shining away from the court. Let them say no until they say yes. <laughs> Plus, a devastating diagnosis that this mom refused to accept. That's not the future I wanted him to have. Watch a miracle unfold. Everybody in the room was just like, it was amazing. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The days change, but the headlines don't. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton went at each other again last night. And this time, it was in an event where candidates usually take a break from attacks on the campaign trail. Clinton and Trump spoke at the Al Smith dinner in New York, and as Heather Sells reports, the jokes were mixed with some insults. Just one night after their boxing match, a.k.a. presidential debate in Las Vegas, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump had a hard time keeping the gloves off. At the Catholic charity dinner, where presidential candidates traditionally offer self-deprecating jokes, the two couldn't resist getting in some digs at each other again, with Clinton going after Trump for his remarks about women and their looks. Donald looks at the Statue of Liberty and sees a four. Maybe a five if she loses the torch and tablet and changes her hair. Hillary has been in Washington a long time. She knows a lot about how government works. And according to her sworn testimony, Hillary has forgotten more things than most of us will ever, ever know. That I can tell you. It could have been a tough night for Clinton, given the WikiLeak revelation that some of her top staffers appear to have a low regard for Catholics. Instead, Trump got booed for some of his attacks, although both got in their jabs. Clinton suggested Trump might not like the dinner because it's rigged and tried to tie him to Russia again. But Donald really is as healthy as a horse. You know, the one Vladimir Putin rides around on. Trump joked that the Catholic crowd of 1,000 was Clinton's largest during their campaign and said he was glad some of the Clinton campaign was there. And I got the chance to meet the people who are working so hard to get her elected. There they are, the heads of NBC, <laughs> CNN, CBS, ABC, there's the New York Times right over there, and the Washington Post. But Clinton got one of the best laughs of the night when she summed up what many people are thinking with a joke. Some of my critics, they think I only say what people want to hear. Well, tonight that is true. And here's exactly what you want to hear. This election will be over very, very soon. <laughs> Heather Sells, CBN News. Yeah, we all look forward to that day. It's 18 days away. And here's my bold prediction. The campaign for 2020 officially will launch on November 9. Well, in other news, officials in the Philippines are trying to play down their president saying the Philippines is separating from the United States. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte made his surprising announcement during a visit to China. Duterte said America has lost now and that he had realigned himself with China's ideology. But Philippine leaders say their country is not cutting economic ties with the U.S. Their trade minister told CNN they're simply strengthening relations with China and other Asian nations. Well, here at home, a new faith-based film starring Aaron Bethay, who gained fame from the movie Fireproof, is tackling a tough theme, faith and tragedy. The film is called New Life. Wendy Griffith sat down with Bethay to talk about her latest project and why she shaved her head for the role. Remember Aaron Bethay? He has fixed me coffee, bought me these pitiful little flowers, and just now called and just see if I'm doing okay. But they made her feature film debut in Fireproof, where she played a neglected wife opposite Kirk Cameron in the 2008 box office surprise hit. Cameron played her firefighter husband who was a hero at work, 
but clueless when it came to keeping their marriage alive. She's probably whining to her friends. I can see them all right now having some sort of group hug. But they says Fireproof was a life-changing movie, not only for those who saw it, but for many who acted in it. It changed everything for me. I mean, I was sort of focused on a career path that was really in theater and in live performance. And because of the success of Fireproof, everything has shifted to film, um, which I have found is actually my, my true love. Today, Erin is in several movies hitting the big screen, including her latest, New Life, which she also co-wrote and produced. What kind of movie is this? What's it about? New Life is a romance, um, very similar to like The Notebook, um, that sort of thing. So any of the ladies out there who love those Nicholas love Sparks Apple. films, yes, um, this is right up their alley. New Life tells the story of Ben and Ava, who meet as children and fall in love, but are later confronted by Ava's devastating diagnosis and struggle to cope with the meaning of it all. That. We are not going to accept that. You shaved your head for this role. <laughs> what was that like? I did. It, you, you know, it was the right choice. Um, for me, I feel like there are so many women who don't have a choice in losing their hair. And it was something that uh, gave some authenticity to the character. I'm not brave for shaving my head. They're brave and uh, my hair grows back and I'm 100% healthy. I bet you have a drawer full of really cool scarves now. I do, and I, like it's funny because I had actually bought a wig because I thought I was gonna be really self-conscious about it and things like that, and I ended up never using it. I just like wore the bald head out in public. But they says unlike Fireproof, which was an overtly faith-based film, New Life is more subtle in its redemptive message and that's where new life falls, and we're hoping it appeals to a really wide audience of women who have loved all these Nicholas Sparks films, but the Nicholas Sparks films also tend to have sexual content and things like that, so we wanted to offer a romance that was for everyone. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. Thanks, Wendy, and New Life opens in select theaters next Friday, October 28th. Well, Jewish people around the world are celebrating the biblical Feast of Tabernacles. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, it's also a meaningful time for Christians. They came from Asia. And from the Pacific Ocean. During the Feast of Tabernacles, thousands of Christians come from all over the world to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles like these Christians from mainland China. They came to support Israel. We love Israel. We stand with Israel and we want to be here. Every year we make it a point to be here and we bring in people to show that there are friends for Israel. Israel has been a close ally of Singapore since the beginning and we owe Israel so much. They've helped us when we were nothing. Israel is the one who helped us. It is my honor to be here to support Israel on behalf of my country. When many nations are turning against Israel, this support is a morale boost for Israelis like this tour guide. I'm excited for King the pilgrims that love Israel and come here with all the problems yeah. that they have in their country, not acknowledging the state of Israel, uh -huh. but yet coming here and supporting us. Many believe this feast is prophetic. The prophet Zechariah said one day all the nations would come and to uh, worship the Lord and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. You're not only remembering God's provision in the wilderness at this feast, but you're looking forward to the Messianic Kingdom. We believe this is the feast of the birthing of the Messianic Kingdom when the Lord arrives to take up the throne of David in Jerusalem. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. A strong show of solidarity for the state of Israel. Gordon, back yeah, to you. Very strong show of solidarity. And the mix has changed. It used to be in years past, the primary delegations came from Europe and North America, but now it's shifted. And now you're seeing Latin America, Asia, Africa. It's, it's wonderful. The number of nations that are coming to celebrate uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. What a wonderful story. There? Sign of the times. Yes, it is. <laughs> Well, up next, she follows her husband's career on the basketball court, and she has more than 4 million Instagram followers of her own. 
We go into the kitchen with Aisha Curry to see how she blends her passion for faith, family, and food after this. Steph Curry is one of the best players in the NBA. Fans love his game, admire his faith, and love for his family. When he's not on the court, he cheers on his wife, who has quite a success story of her own. Ephraim Graham introduces us to Aisha Curry. When Golden State Warriors superstar Steph Curry takes the court, he sees a familiar face on the sidelines. Have you always been a basketball fan? No. Mm. Oh, gosh. Not at all. I, I come from a very artsy family. Um, the only sort of introduction to sports that I had before meeting my husband was um, Buffalo Bills football and Doug Flutie flakes. My dad, <laughs> my dad grew up in Buffalo and um, has been a Bills fan all his life. Now, Aisha Curry's focus is NBA basketball as she cheers on her husband at almost all of the Warriors' home games. Away from the court. Hi, guys. Aisha here. Today, I have a recipe for you guys that is a staple in our household, especially at breakfast time. It is my brown sugar bacon. Her passion Again, moves to the kitchen, to sharing the recipes and cooking tips with the millions who follow her online. And in her best-selling cookbook, The Season Life, Food, Family, Faith, and the Joy of Eating Well. Was this a hard thing to do? Yeah, it was. <laughs> there were points when I wanted to give up. Um, uh, there were points that were enjoyable, and there were points where I just didn't want to do it anymore. But I pushed through, and I'm really happy that I did um, because I, I now have this great book full of quick and easy recipes to for everybody to enjoy, but more so for me to pass down to my daughters. Your passion for cooking is clear, but there was a period you were pursuing acting. Yeah, that's, um, it's so funny because looking back now, it just seems like my childhood. I've done it since I was about two. I um, left high school early and went out to LA to pursue it. And it got to a point where I realized that it wasn't for me. Um, I guess I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. I was steadily working, but I, I didn't have a passion for it. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, didn't know what my career was gonna be. Yeah. And I struggled with that for a while. Um, but I prayed about it, I pressed through, um, and realized that it was staring me in my face my whole <laughs> life. <laughs> Prayer and a gentle push from her husband. So Chef Curry with the pot, been cooking with the sauce, Chef Curry with the pot, boy helped Aisha begin sharing her fun kitchen life, and fans quickly followed. How important do you think it is for, for people to acknowledge God in that process? Oh, I think it's very important, because you could find yourself in a place you don't want to be really, really quickly. So it's, um, I feel like it's important to make sure you're always praying, always talking, um, to have like clarity of mind and peace. Aisha regularly shares her family's Christian faith, acknowledging even online, She's first a believer, then a wife, and then a mother. Now, you have a big social media following. You've got more yeah. than 4 million on Instagram. You're very open about your life, the ups yeah. and downs and so forth, uh, and passionate. But that comes with, with critics, too. You, yeah. you take some heat sometimes. Yeah, I mean, nobody's... 100% of people aren't going to like what you do 100% of the time. She quickly felt that heat after tweeting criticisms of the NBA. And again, when questioning fashion trends, she found a little too revealing. I mean, you could be an angel and somebody's still going to have something negative to say. <laughs> and so I really, I really take it with a grain of salt, no pun intended. Your husband's phenomenal on the basketball court. Thank you. In the kitchen, what's the story? <laughs> he, he's getting better. Um, you know, persistence <laughs> is key. It didn't start out so well. Um, and mm -hmm. there's some stories about yeah, that in the yeah, book as well. Yeah. But he's gotten better. <laughs> <laughs> and Aisha knows a bit about persistence. In addition to the cookbook, she also has a show on the Food Network. But it came only after the executive said no a few times. I guess my, uh, my motto is, let them say no until they say yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't, say don't stop, don't stop.
Um, Ephraim Graham, CBN News, happening. San Francisco. A dream uh, best wishes to her. Great success with that wonderful television show. But I'm not so sure about brown sugar bacon. I don't know if yeah. your car, if that's a training meal for an NBA star. <laughs> Um, yeah. would, you, would your cardiologist approve? Yeah, it sounds wonderful, but it does. maybe one piece occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up, a professional home wrecker who got husbands hooked on drugs. Once I got the guy high, that was easy because now I'm invited into his home. Everywhere I went, I destroyed homes, business owners, lawyers, dentists. See how this ruthless drug dealer wrecked home after home until a supernatural voice stopped him. Juan Martinez was a home wrecker and proud of it. He would target a guy, get him hooked on drugs, and then get his wife hooked as well. He destroyed home after home this way until the day he was making a delivery and a voice stopped him in his tracks. In the morning, shake your sleep. In the morning, shake your feet. I'm gonna come. Everywhere I went, I destroyed homes, business owners, lawyers, dentists, and I thought I did it best. Juan Martinez, an ambitious drug dealer, grew up willing to do anything to feel accepted and prove himself. Parents got divorced when I was like eight years old, um, so I really didn't have a father figure per se. I was looking at outside and what was in movies, and I thought that the toughest guy out there and the guy that had the most money and the most women, that that was really the picture of what a guy was like. Juan started hanging out with the older kids in his New Jersey neighborhood. They introduced him to drugs, and by 13, he was using and selling marijuana and cocaine. I felt accepted by these guys. They taught me what they knew. They taught me their trade. So I'm thinking, OK, if this is what I need to do, then I had to top everybody. And so that's who I became. Years later, Juan moved to Texas to expand his territory and was introduced to meth. He started using it and then selling it with one goal in mind. I wanted to make a lot of money. I was going to come here. I was going to do the big score. And I was going to be the, one of the main distributors in New York City and New Jersey and all those other states. Juan began by targeting families in the suburbs. His strategy was to first befriend the fathers. I know they were drinkers, and we'd drink, and eventually, uh, you know, hey, you want to get high and get the guy high. And once I got the guy high, that was easy, because now I'm invited into his home. Once Juan got both husband and wife hooked, he became their dealer and moved on to the next home. I felt I was proving myself to everybody finally. And it was this weird world, this prideful, weird world that uh, made me feel like, yeah, I was accomplishing something in life. As long as Juan stayed high, he didn't have to think about what he was doing. I didn't think that the things that I was doing were bad. And if you don't think you're doing anything wrong, you just begin to chase after something that really will never satisfy you, but you chase after it anyway. One day, Juan was out on a delivery when he heard a voice he didn't recognize. I'm hearing, why are you killing, stealing, and destroying the very lives I'm giving people? For the first time in my life, I felt horrible. I am just weeping and crying, right? And then it's like, in a twinkling of an eye, everything stops. I still went and made my deliveries, but there was a thought every time I handed it to somebody, you know, so I would hand it to a woman and I was thinking, man, I'm ruining her life. I would hand it to a guy, man, I'm ruining their life. Juan had gone to church as a child and believed the voice was God's, but didn't know how to change. A short time later, he was arrested for meth possession and landed in jail, facing a 25 year sentence. I've hit rock bottom, nowhere else to go, I'm done. Uh, I'm, I'm at a place now where um, I don't have anybody. One night, encouraged by a cellmate, Juan prayed and read the Bible. Weeping, I got on my knees. 
I am repenting about everything. I'm literally going to the T and thinking about things that I have done in my life. I was like, I'm sorry, God, I want you in my life. I want this Jesus, you know, I, I want this. Juan surrendered his life to Christ and lost all desire for drugs. I didn't feel like I had to prove anything anymore. I felt like uh, I was accepted, loved. I just felt this love. Something happened. Uh, I was never the same again. Juan's sentence was reduced to four years, and he spent his time in prison growing in his faith. Today, he is married and has a family, and as a pastor, goes back to the very neighborhoods he dealt drugs and shares the gospel. Jesus filled every void. When I didn't have a father, he, he was my father. Whatever void it is that has you empty, you can fill that void with Jesus. Jesus wants to give you life. And he wants to do it for you. He wants to give you life. That's why he came, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what the Bible says. Have life and have it more abundantly. He's not here to deprive you of things. He's here to bring you life, joy, peace. These are the things he comes with. Now, maybe you're like Juan. Maybe a horrible tragedy happened to you in your childhood ever since you've been trying to fill that void. Maybe a tragedy didn't happen, but you just have this void. You're trying to find what is life about? What am I about? And maybe you've tried the things that Juan has tried. Maybe you went after drugs or some sort of sense of success or prestige or money, power, fame, these things. And then you find that they don't satisfy. You can achieve it and you keep chasing after it and chasing after it and chasing after it and it never satisfies. Well, when you find Jesus, he satisfies. He satisfies that longing. He fills you with his love, with his joy, with his peace. And when you find that, you understand this is what you were made for. God created us to live with him in a garden. And it's that God-shaped hole in our hearts, it can only be filled with him. Solomon said it, he said, God has put eternity in our hearts. And that eternity only gets filled with the eternal one. We were made for a relationship with him. And if we don't have it, we're chasing in all the wrong places. But when you do have it, now well, there's nothing left to prove. You start to realize you found the one thing, the one thing that makes all the difference. If you want this, it's real easy to get it. All you have to do is ask for it. And even if you don't believe that it's real, you can say this wonderful prayer, Jesus, if you're real, if you really came for me, if you really died on a cross, if you really rose again, if you really are my savior, could you show me? And if you pray that, not jokingly, but if you pray that with all of your heart, he'll answer, he'll come to you. So if you want this peace, you want this joy, you want this life that God has for you, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer and let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right, just say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you and I want to know that you're real. I want to know that you're there, that you can hear my prayer. And Jesus, I especially want to know if you're my savior, if you could forgive me, if you could set me free, if you could fill me with your love, your joy, your peace. 
if you could give me the life you intend for me. And Jesus, I ask for that right now. I ask that you come into my heart, that you make me new, that you set me free. And Jesus, if you do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, for those who just prayed, fill them with your love, with your joy. Show them their purpose. Give them a hope and a future, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to make a phone call. And when you do, we've got something for you. It's called A New Day. And there's a CD teaching. What do Christians believe? What do I do now? How do I live the Christian life? It's all free. All you have to do is pick up the phone. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I prayed with that guy on TV. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. We'll send it to you absolutely free. There's no financial obligation at all. Uh, we want you to have it. We want you to be encouraged. We want you to know what to do next. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry, over to you. Well, still ahead, a baby who was acting strangely, and doctors soon discovered the reason why. When we examined this young boy, we saw his eyes, both eyes were filled with cancer. Watch how this child was healed. That's coming up. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A new report from a coalition of Christian groups has found Christian and Yazidi refugees in Germany are being targeted in religiously motivated attacks. Groups like Open Doors Germany and the International Society for Human Rights found Christians are discriminated against, beaten and received death threats from Muslim refugees and partly by the Muslim staff. The group believes the attacks on Christians are even more widespread than reported. Operation Blessing is still in North Carolina and Virginia, helping people recover from the damage caused by Hurricane Matthew. 78-year-old Helen Moton and her disabled grandson were able to get to higher ground when Matthew hit, but their home was submerged in nearly three feet of water. Operation Blessing helped Helen remove damage from her home. This woman of faith thanked Operation Blessing for its help and said, quote, if it weren't for the grace of God, I would be falling apart. Operation Blessing needs volunteers in Fayetteville, North Carolina. You can find out how you can help by going to ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Today, Samira is always on her feet, dancing for joy. But when we first met her, she could barely walk, and her condition broke her mom's heart. Samira's eyes sparkle when she smiles. The spirited seven-year-old from Western Ukraine seems to have no cares in the world. The truth is, Samira was born with two club feet, a serious disability that causes severe pain and limits her movement. Her mother, Nora, suffers too. I feel pain because she's my child. I can't look at her without crying, but I can't do anything for her. I can't pay for the surgery that would allow her to walk and run and play like other children. Samira rarely cries, but this day her tears fall when she sees her mother crying. I have one dream for Samira to be healthy and walk normally. Yet Nora knows her dream is unlikely to come true. This poor family can barely afford food. And like most people in this village, Nora and her husband are uneducated and their job opportunities are limited. My husband is hired by people to do jobs like cutting grass or digging graves and is only paid two to four dollars a day. That's why Nora was overjoyed when CBN's Orphan's Promise opened a school nearby. 
she enrolled Samira right away. But we knew that Samira needed much more than reading and writing skills. She needed surgery that her parents could never afford. So it wasn't long before we located a skilled surgeon and paid the full cost of Samira's surgery and post-operative care. Eleven months later, when Samira's cast was removed, her legs and feet were normal. My child can do everything. What else could I ever want? Thank you, because it all is because of you. I can walk and run. I can play with other children. I even take dancing lessons at my school. Thank you for giving me straight legs. You know, I love this story because you made such an incredible difference in this child's life. And when you do something like that, when you step into the very point of someone's need, not only did you change her life, not only did you touch and change her parents' hearts and lives, that whole community was watching. And they say, who did this? Who cared enough to come from far away and help people that they may never see? It's you, 700 Club Partners. That's what you do every day of the week all around the world. We want to say thank you for seeing people's need, for standing up and saying, I want to make a difference. You really can. And when we all link arms together, that's how we make a big difference. So that's why today we're asking you to join the 700 Club. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. And listen, here's another way you can make a difference. When you call and join today, calling our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000, would you do it saying, I want to use Pledge Express? That's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work, but you save some administrative costs in the process on this end for us, so even more of your gift can go right into the lives of people like Samira and her family. When you use Pledge Express, our way of saying thank you for doing that is to send you a Power for Life teaching. You'll get one of these every month. We think they'll bless you. These are teachings we get as a family here at CBN. We'd love to share them with you. This one is called The Power of Knowing God's Love by Gordon. It'll be just one of them that you receive when you say, I want to join the 700 Club and I want to do it using Pledge Express. We say thank you. Gordon? Well, up next, doctors are stunned when a baby is supernaturally healed. It was a little bit shocking that it spontaneously went away and went away so fast. Everybody in the room was just like, <laughs> like smiling and like, it was amazing. See why this was so amazing when we come back. Sarah Poe heard devastating news from her son's doctors after he was diagnosed with cancer. She was told that her baby was only going to get worse, but Tara refused to believe it. And nine months later, doctors couldn't believe what actually happened. On January 1st, 2011, Tom and Tara Poe were celebrating the new year with the birth of their son Maddox. It was surreal. We were just super excited. This was our first child together, so it was a really beautiful bonding moment for our family. But when Maddox was seven months old, Tom and Tara started noticing something wasn't right with their son. I remember a moment when I was holding him and looking down at him and looking in his eyes, and I just didn't feel that bond that I knew I should feel when I looked at my child. If I called his name, he would look, but he wouldn't be looking at me. He'd be looking kind of in the area. After a thorough examination, their pediatrician referred them to an eye specialist. He looked in his eyes, and then he kind of just sat back and took a deep breath, and then he said, I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, but Maddox has tumors in his eyes, and that's why he can't see. And then I looked back at the doctor, and I said, is he going to be okay? He told me, I can't tell you that for sure. That was probably the worst day of my life. I was so angry and like almost yelling, why, why is this happening? The specialist then sent them to the Wills Eye Institute in Philadelphia, where they met Dr. Carol Shields. When we examined this young boy, we saw both eyes had advanced retinoblastoma. His eyes, both eyes were filled with cancer. The good news was the cancer hadn't spread, 
and Dr. Shields told the couple that six months of systemic chemotherapy should eliminate it completely. But there was a chance their son could lose one or both of his eyes. When I thought about Maddox being blind for the rest of his life, that terrified me because that's not the future I wanted him to have. And so I prayed from the very beginning, thank you God that Maddox can see everything perfectly out of both of his beautiful eyes. And that's just what I would say over and over again. And I really, truly believed it. By the end of chemo, the tumors were gone, but there were still signs that the cancer could return. Then eight months later, another tumor appeared in Maddox's right eye. It was treated successfully with radiation, but the side effects were severe. We cured the cancer, but then he's left with all this swelling in his eye. And in his case, his retina was all blistered up. And when it gets blistered up, we call that retinal detachment. There would be probably an 80 to 90% chance he would lose his eye. I wasn't prepared and I just, I felt sick. I felt scared. And I just remember looking at her and saying, he's not gonna need his eye removed. He said, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna pray to God for a miracle and he's not going to need his eye removed. I was really sort of amazed by her belief. And, you know, I would chuckle and I'd say, well, you know, getting back to medicine, medically, scientifically, he is at risk to lose this eye. And she would shake her head and say, I, I really don't think that's gonna happen. One day, Tom and Tara were at home watching the 700 Club when Gordon Robertson started praying. So this, so there's somebody with um, blistering on your eyeball, and it's a particular problem in your right eye, and God is, is healing that blistering now, and all that pain and discomfort and inability has turned into ability and comfort, and you're pain-free now. In Jesus' name, just receive that. I felt joy because God's given us signs that he's here and he's gonna, you know, heal him and take care of him. One month later, Tom and Tara watched and waited as Dr. Shields and her team took a careful look at Maddox's eye. I examined him with my scopes and I was looking and I looked at my assistant and I said, his detachment's gone. No fluid, no detachment. It, w it was a little bit shocking that it spontaneously went away and went away so fast. Everybody in the room was just like, <laughs> like smiling and like, it was amazing. I started laughing a little bit because I was just like, whoa, it really, this really happened. Since then, Maddox hasn't had any problems with his eyes and enjoys wrestling and playing video games with his two brothers. This was an amazing, situation that happened. Some things in science are not explainable by scientific reasoning. And, you know, sometimes we just look at each other and scratch our heads and say, you know, someday we'll realize scientifically what exactly happened. It's just, um, I mean, a miracle, obviously, but I just, I know, I feel now that I know Jesus and God on such a personal level. I mean, honestly, I, I have no doubts that uh, God can do anything. He can do anything. Uh, and medical science is never gonna get to the end of that. When God does miracles, it defies explanation. Uh, you, you look at it and you go, the, the glory of the Lord has been revealed. Uh, he spoke and the universe came into being. You, you can't explain these things, but it helps when you believe. And I love Tara's prayer, that wonderful mother. Here, here she is, she's thanking God in advance for the healing. I thank you that my son is going to be able to see clearly through both eyes. That's a wonderful prayer. And realize when you thank him for what he has already done, then you receive it. 
And these aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus. You can find it in Mark chapter 11, where he explains to his disciples the key to miracles. Number one key, have faith in God. Don't have faith in your prayer. Don't have faith in some ritual. Have faith in God. He's the miracle provider. He's the one that does the heavy lifting. He's the one who does the miracle. Have faith in God. And then he says, when you stand praying, believe that you have already received. So put yourself in that place, just as Tara put herself in that place. She believed that she had already received, and in that belief was thanking God for what he was doing. Now, she was doing that before radiation. She was doing that before chemo. She was doing that before the blisters. She was doing that before recurrence. She was saying, I believe. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. And she persevered through. You have to fight the good fight of faith. Now, Terry and I are going to pray. Here's a wonderful verse for you. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. So we're going to agree. What I ask you to do is reach out in faith and touch it. Just lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing. And we're going to thank God for the healing and then receive it in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you. And as people are reaching out and touching and laying hands, we come into agreement with them and we just declare thanksgiving mm -hmm for what you are doing, how you are doing such wonderful miracles today. For you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You have risen from the dead, mm -hmm. and your resurrection power is in us now, and we can agree touching anything, and it shall be done. So Lord, stretch forth your hand to do wonderful miracles. We look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. We look to your sacrifice, and we declare by the stripes of Jesus Christ, by his blood, I am healed, I am made whole. There's someone, you're, um, uh, you've got a detached retina in your left eye, and you're saying, please say that. Uh, and that detachment is just going to miraculously heal back up, and the retina is going to adhere back to the eyeball. You're healed now in Jesus' name. Just take your, your you've got your uh, left hand over your left eye. Just take it off, open your eye, and realize you can see perfectly clear through that eye now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Terry? There's someone else. You have... Um polyps in your sinus cavity and it's not that's exactly the term that's been used it's not like you have cysts or tumors they're just called polyps but it's very obstructive like your breathing is affected you just everything god is healing that for you right now just take a deep breath in and breathe out and you have been healed um you've got cancer in your lymph nodes and it's a particular problem on the right side of your neck in that lymph gland and then in the lymph gland underneath uh, your right armpit. And both are swollen and painful. And God has healed you. And he's setting you free from that. You don't have to fear death anymore. He is, he is in control of this. He's restoring you now. In Jesus' name, be healed and be set free. Someone else with nerve pain on the right side of your fa face that goes up into your um, uh, the upper right part of your skull and God's just taking that nerve pain away from you and all that irritation and uh, all the wrong signals coming from that nerve gone now in Jesus name just receive it. and there's a, a woman you have arthritis in your hands it is so painful the ache is so deep and so chronic that you're just miserable all of the time just lift your hands up and praise the Lord right now as he sets you free from that receive it in Jesus name I think name. that's a general word for many people with arthritic conditions in your hands I just 
So you're getting new, uh, new life to them. And what you couldn't do before, you couldn't button a button, button it now and realize God has healed you. He set you free from that. Curvature of the spine healed right now in Jesus name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. Uh, we can't thank you enough for what you've done for us, how you gave your life for us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Mm -hmm. If you have been healed, we want to share your good report. We want to let people know God's in the miracle business and what he did 2,000 years ago, he's still doing today. He hasn't changed. So call us. Let us know. 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer. That's why Jesus taught about it. Uh, that's why he gave the parables to encourage us to pray and keep on praying. Uh, it's that persistent prayer that gets an answer. Tara was praying and praying and praying and praying. So do that. And if we're here for you if you need it. Uh, all you have to do is call us. We'd be glad to pray with you. It's our honor, our privilege to do that. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Well, coming up, we're going to bring it on with your email questions right after this. answer some of the questions you've sent in via email. This first one, Gordon, comes from McKenna, who says, I'm almost 16 years old. When I was younger, complete strangers would walk up to my mom and tell her that God had a special plan for me. I used to be so close to him, and I would talk to him all the time. But when I was 11, I really started to become distant, and I've lost my relationship with God. I've been to rehab three times, foster care twice, and I'm there currently. And I've been in multiple placements in mental health hospitals for behavioral issues and suicidal attempts. I need God back in my life. I pray, but I feel he never listens or answers. How can I redevelop a strong relationship with God and most importantly, find out what his plan for me is? Well, McKenna, my heart just goes out to you. Um, I, 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 you know, when I'm, when I'm hearing the question, I go, well, what are you in rehab for? What, what are the underlying issues? Why are you in foster care? You had a mother and you know, what, what are the underlying factors here? But just uh, in terms of your relationship with God, you have to hold on to that and hold on to the promise. And it's a promise for you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's a double promise that he's there. He hasn't gone away. And you can be in relationships sometimes where they're still there, but they've forsaken you. And in their heart, they're far away from you. And God's promise, I will never do that. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise for you. If you want to hear from God, the easiest way to do it is to open the Bible and read it. I would encourage you to do that daily, multiple times a day. Let the Word of God shape your thinking so you no longer think a way that's contrary to Scripture. When you do that and you fill your life with the words of the prophets, with the inspired Word of God, then all these issues uh, fade away and you'll start to hear His voice again. Here's a prayer for you. It's from the Apostle Paul that he, he asked God to open the eyes of your understanding. Ask Him to open your ears that you could hear his word. Ask him to give you a heart that you may comprehend the greatness of his power towards us who believe. Pray that and he will answer. We leave you these words from Psalm, O oh Lord my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. God bless you, we'll see you again.